I had no desire to do it. And that was the condition in which I agreed to take this on. Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, Nevada elementary school teacher Tierney Cahill discusses her book, Ms. Cahill for Congress, the story of her improbable campaign for U.S. representative on a dare from her sixth grade students. With only $7,000 and a campaign staff of 12-year-olds, she won the 2000 Democratic primary in Nevada's second district. Ms. Cahill discusses her book with District of Columbia delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. Well, welcome to C-SPAN, and Ms. Cahill, welcome to Washington. Thank you so much. This is the book, Ms. Cahill for Congress, and the subtitle, One Fearless Teacher, Her Sixth Grade Class, and the Election That Changed Their Lives Forever. Now, let me just ask the obvious question. Ms. Cahill, how does a divorced mother of three children, no house, two-bedroom, one bath, how'd you figure that out, <laughs> apartment, two or three jobs, one cocktail uh, uh, waitressing, shall we call it, where you sometimes get home to, or got home at two, maybe four o'clock, who's counting, mm -hmm. in, in the morning. Um, extracurricular activities for her students. Mm -hmm. How does such a woman decide to run for, of all things, Congress. Not the school board, not the city council, <laughs> but the Congress. Right. Well, um, actually, the students asked me to run for president first, but I wasn't old enough. So uh, then we had to look for something else. And then you went down to senator. It, we did. We, they marched right through. They, they wanted to know if we could run for the Supreme Court, and we had to talk about how that worked because I couldn't really run for that. And then they wanted a Senate pro tem and Speaker of the House, and they just marched right on down. So, <laughs> yep, <laughs> yes, they did. And, uh, Finally got to the bottom, those of us in the House of Representatives. <laughs> well, um, they felt it needed to be something important, and that was a federal race. They wanted it to be in Washington, D.C. They wanted it to matter. And so I'm sure they didn't think it was the bottom of the, the barrel there. They thought that was pretty, pretty big stuff. Now, do understand that we're talking about a real campaign. This is not a school project. Although, uh, Tierney, you were constantly asked, was it a real campaign? Were you not, were you oh, not sure. asked? Oh, sure. We had to defend that quite a lot, yes. Um, tell me for real, Tierney. Mm -hmm. Yes, your students dared you. Yes, you took them up. You felt guilty when you told them they could do everything. You not doing what they, what they asked you if you would do. But did it really awaken something in you that may have been dormant all the time? Maybe. You know, I feel my parents are fairly politically active and were very outspoken about their politics in our home and taught us to have a conscience and to be involved and certainly to vote and to be participatory citizens. And, um, you know, I thought, what a, what a great opportunity to really be a public servant. I already felt like I was a public servant as a teacher. <laughs> And then Heaven I was knows just, you were. <laughs> and I just felt it was taking it on to that next level of really serving my community. And I really felt that as I was out campaigning and meeting my constituents and the people and the communities uh, that I visited that I really felt for, you know, and wanted to help. Well, it turns out that you didn't start out to be a teacher. Uh, it's, I was very interested to read about your, your early life. You're the yes. daughter of an engineer and a father who didn't try to keep you from professions like his, but taught you how to do gears, mm -hmm. taught you work to be an cars. athlete, yep. work on cars, be an athlete, do woodworking, That's the right. kinds of things that guys do. That's it right. does seem to me that your father and perhaps your times and your mother had done the feminist work on you. Describe how you came to be a teacher rather than something you had all also toyed with being a civil rights lawyer. Yes. Um, I was dead set on being a civil rights lawyer, actually. I had uh, taken a class at the University of New Mexico, African American History. And it was African American History I, and I was so addicted to it because I had always loved history, loved political science. And I remember challenging my professor, Dr. Cortez Williams, and saying, you know, either every history book I've ever read in my life lied to me, 
where you're not telling me the truth and all I mean I can't believe I've never heard any of this before and he kind of giggled and said oh you poor little thing now where did you grow up that you never heard any of this and, and where did you grow up Tony? Reno Nevada and Sacramento California and um, I was in predominantly Caucasian upper middle class schools and black history to me was Martin Luther King and Rosetta Parks and that was it. That was the beginning and the end of it. That was, that was pretty much it and so I had found a new frontier in African American history and I was um, very very excited about it and took every class I could got a minor in African American history and and that leads to civil rights law I take it yes I was very very interested in um, pursuing a degree in civil rights law and um, went back to that mentor of mine Dr. Williams and, and told him as I was graduating getting ready to take the LSAT and preparing to go to law school and choose a school and he said now why are you doing this why do you want to be a civil rights lawyer and I told him about discrimination and intolerance and how it really bothered me deeply and I wanted to go out and make that my life's work and he said okay alright well obviously you don't care about money because you're never gonna make any money you know this right and I said no that's really not my motivation I want my life to have meaning I want to give back I want to do something that's important for my country and he was the one who said well then why don't you think about teaching you know uh, nothing wrong with being a lawyer but there's a lot of them and uh, you know goodness knows there's plenty of hungry lawyers out there that just aren't making it and uh, knowing you you'll end up taking on lots of pro bono cases and they'll get appealed and appealed and really you're you're being reactive to the situation instead of proactive if you really want to be proactive in dealing with intolerance and prejudice why don't you think about being a teacher think of how many kids you can impact over a career so you were going to impact people's lives one way or the other now watch out for Miss Cahill don't think you know her <laughs> just because of what she's said so he says think about being a teacher you who were raised um, post-feminist let me call it I'm the yes. feminist generation so you could have been anything you wanted to be and civil rights law occurs to you instead he says be a teacher now so you decide to be a teacher <laughs> They, it looks like your students are going to propel you closer to law in the first place. And by the way, I'd like to just say a word about your good advice from your professor. As, a, as I continue to be a law professor um, at Georgetown University Law School where I taught full time, mm -hmm. I have never been in the habit of saying to people, you really ought to go into law just because I'm in law. Sure. Indeed, I, my favorite joke is we've been over lawyered since Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> We really do need teachers, teachers like the kind of teacher you turned out to be, and we're going to get into the kind of teacher you turned out to be. But first, let me explore a little bit more about this campaign. You bet. I was intrigued by the mystery judge. Oh, yes. Uh, now, I've always felt that judges can hardly purge themselves uh, entirely of their um, political instincts. The mm -hmm. politics is in their, their souls. I wish you'd talk about this advice from this mystery judge who found you and apparently was the only real advisor other than your students that you ever had. Right. Well, I, I don't know that I should use his name. No, I'm not asking <laughs> I'm, his I'm, name. We yeah, want him to keep his we, job. We do. <laughs> um, you know, but judges are, are largely elected in, in many seats. So um, they are political animals. And he had been involved uh, deeply with the Democratic Party. Um, of course, I had to step away from that once he became a judge, but I, I know he kept his eye on it. His wife was a middle school teacher, and so, of course, he had heard about me, and um, he wanted to meet with me to see how serious I was. He said he needed to look me in the eye to see if I really was uh, willing to take on what it was going to, uh, you know, muster out of myself and if I was prepared for that. And so he was really trying to kind of you know, shore me up and see what I was made of, I suppose. But he was just really a, a great guy. We met sort of incognito. I remember thinking, well, this is really odd, you know, but he had the hat and the raincoat <laughs> and, you know, and sat next to me in this little diner that is known, uh, Jim Kelly's Nugget, the back of this casino where they, I think they have five bar stools where they sell these really greasy, horrible hamburgers. And I say horrible, they're called awful offals and they're wonderful. <laughs> but, um, you know, he sat there and he hardly would look at me. Talk, I mean, I just felt like I was meeting with, you know, a CIA agent or someone. And um, he said, I just, I need to know what you've done, who you've talked to, what kind of things you've done to prepare for this. And of course, I was a huge neophyte. I, I really had, had very little knowledge about how the inner workings of the party um, worked or 
or the process itself and was learning on, on the go.